We are not wearing helmets. And a little background, Island Girls Rock has a really special relationship with whom we like to call Auntie Cheryl. Not only do we love her as an author, a writer, um, you know, a thought leader, she's in inspiring in so many ways, but we also had a very loving relationship with her son, Malik, who you may know as Five Dog of A Tribe Called Quest. Anika was the closest to him in the crew. And through Anika, we all came to know and love him and eat his saltfish, which I will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> saltfish and bake. And he was like, <laughs> he was not happy with me. But Dominique, you know me and food. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and Meek made it, man. And we were walking around with it all day, to be fair. And all I could smell was the coconut bake and the saltfish. Wow. Um, so you wanted <laughs> some? Well, it was for him, but it took us so long to find him in all the crowds of that day, you know, that I, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, he was a real homeboy in that way. Real Very much Caribbean so. man. <laughs> Very much so. And did me proud when I hosted the Caribbean Roots of Hip Hop, when he oh. declared, you know, yeah, that's when I first met him, Auntie. I was hosting oh, okay. um, the Caribbean Roots of Hip Hop, and I got him to sing some Sparrow. <laughs> oh, okay. I think I heard about that. <laughs> yeah. It was a very <laughs> joyful moment, for sure. So I am pleased to have known him, and thank you yes. for bringing light into the world. Truly, truly never forgotten. Never forgotten. You're welcome. <laughs> Auntie Cheryl. Yeah. We have had you featured on Let's Get Lit in person. You know, before pre-COVID, we had a lovely event in London at the Canvas Cafe, and you were reading from your collection at the time, and, you know, we got to exchange so much. We had a lovely crowd, a lovely audience, and it was a beautiful experience. And as beautiful. much as we wanted to replicate that in London this year, as they say, the stars did not align. <laughs> So we decided to speak with you virtually. We feel that people are still very much open to virtual gatherings. Um, and it's lovely to have you here with us again. So oh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, Caribbean is my thing. So <laughs> no matter what I do, I'm a Caribbean woman first. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So yes. before we actually get stuck into some of your reading from your late, well, your latest collection, We Are Not Wearing Helmets. When you sent me um, the PDF copy, the first thing that actually caught my attention was the title, We Are Not Wearing Helmets. Yeah. Where the title of that collection actually came from and what does it mean, We Are Not Wearing Helmets? Yeah, so, um... As you, as you um, notice that this book has a lot to do with community, where I live in Brooklyn, other parts of Brooklyn, actually Harlem, you know, these places that were formerly black owned and operated mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. no longer like that. And we are being pushed out, not just financially, but physically, the police is rougher with the people in certain neighborhoods. You know, it seems like all the crime, Black people are blamed for it. And I'm not saying that they don't do their share of stabbing and killing. We saw this really uh, wonderful dancer get stabbed and killed recently. Yeah. yeah. So I just feel we are not protected. Basically, we've never been protected. We are not wearing helmets. So that, you know, a helmet is something that would protect you. Well, we are not wearing helmets. We are sitting innocent and open. And the cover of the the cover of the book has this little girl on it. That's me. And she is so innocent and so open to the world. So that was the image I wanted to use for how innocent we are, really as adults, I mean, and when I say innocent, I mean, we still work hard, take two or three jobs to make our family comfortable. We still take all the cleaning, washing, handling all the dirty shit they've got in these different places. 
and we are not protected. We take care of these people's children mm -hmm. and they don't protect us, even mm -hmm. while we're taking care of their kids. Of their most precious thing. Yeah, their most precious thing. And you know, we're not their most precious thing, mm -hmm. even in terms of, so that has been the something that has bothered me and troubled me for a long time. And I knew that I was going to focus on that. But on the other hand, there I I honor several of the women writers, historians, artists, poets that brought me to this place where I am as a writer for the last 30 years. The women that modeled it for me, the women that took me under their wings. I remember re um, maybe five years ago, I do this writing style called Zuhitsu. And okay. it is an old Japanese form. And the woman who brought it back to New York or US is a, a poet by the name of Kimiko Han. She's okay. a Japanese American. And um, she, I was going to take a course and I didn't have the money, it was so expensive. And she said, well, um, her husband was teaching there at the school. I've never really told anybody this. But um, she said to me, you're going to come and stay in my quarters. Because she and her husband had different quarters because they were teaching for the same um, outfit. She said, you're going to stay in my house and you're going to be there. She said, I'm not going to be the only one that teaches Zuhitsu. You are wow. going to do it because, you, you know, like I had such an interest in it. So I'm talking about things like that where people actually take you under their wings. Unity. They say, spend a week with me and we will go over poems. And so these are the people that I thank, I thank in the book. And really, they are my helmets. Um. My mother... My daughter-in-law, I can't tell you how my daughter-in-law takes care of me. It's just yeah. unbelievable. And so I wanted to just put both of those um, parallels into the book. So um, that's where the title, it's a long explanation, but that's oh, where the title really? came from. Yeah. I feel that I, we haven't been protected. We're not now. And God forbid, we might never be. Your story about the Japanese American author, you know, that's that's how community shows up. That yes. is how we become protected when we become our sisters' keepers. Yes. And so and also that is how we build our ecosystems and legacy. So she having this gift was determined, as she said, I am not going to be the only person mm -hmm. that teaches me. Yeah. So let's forget about the finances, you come and stay with me. Oh yeah, yeah. You were doing this course and that truly is community. And oh, yeah. it, you know, for me, you know, we are descendants of Africans, of those who were captured and enslaved, but traditionally before our traditions were interrupted, you know, we worked within community, we thrived within community. Oh, yeah. And of course that was purposefully fractured during the slave trade. It was very intentionally fractured. And so we are still recovering. We are in recovery from that. Yes. And so what I have seen, especially since, and not that this didn't exist before COVID and everything just kind of coming to the surface and having to be faced in terms of Black Lives Matter. What I see happening is that we are returning to an understanding of how integral community is to our well-being and within that we have the protection so maybe like you said just from even you sharing your experience we are maybe now able to return to the place where we are retrieving our helmets yes you know and and in my opinion also my helmets are my family stories it's the language and the stories and the culture of my african caribbean heritage and family so those are the kinds of helmets that you know that we use or should use each other um this this whole thing about raising families in and living in family homes and group homes like i grew up in an extended family household you know right. even both in trinidad and in new york 
We don't really have those anymore. Mm -hmm. I have quite a few friends. They have children, no relatives around. Yeah. yeah. You know, so even those little things we've lost, you know. True. And I, I guess also we have to acknowledge that, you know, sometimes our blood, our biological family are not our community, but then we get to choose the our chosen own, fit, right? I really the like this. Uh -huh. So there's that as well, you know, and I, I I can speak for myself in saying, you know, I I have a very deep relationship with my chosen family. You know, the last few years, just like everyone else, it's been intense and insane. And my chosen family often, more often than not, are the ones that will just send a message. Hey, Shani, thinking of you today, you know, yeah. and I in turn do the same for my chosen family. So there is there is community there too. You know, community shows up in many ways now. And I think for yes. everyone on the call, you're here on this call. This within itself is a community. And oh, knows, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> The <laughs> island girls who rock. <laughs> That's right. We sure do. All island girls rock. So I'm beginning with um, two poems from my book called Arrival. And it came out in 2017. And that's my mother on the cover. I love this. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> and no matter, you know, like I, I, I moved to New York when I was 13 without my mother. And I came to live with her sister and her sister's husband. And so people, you know, ask, I always kept accent, even though I was teased for it in high school, I always kept it. Because once I moved to New York and I saw that we were not on the TV, there was no recognition of us, <clears throat> I decided that I needed to keep my accent because it, for a lot of reasons, it became some, one of the most important things to me. So this is one of those poems called I Name Gyal, and I'm spelling it G-Y-A-L. Now this book, Arrival, has four I Name Gyal poems, and I consider the through line that connects this book. I Name Gyal, three. My home name is Gal. I remember who I am. Braided Gal drinking cocoa tea, eating fry bake. I make sardine and onion stew. Just like mommy teach me. I remember who I am. I remember to say Paliwal, not friend. I remember to say Bodhi, not string beans. I remember to say melangen, not eggplant. Zabaka, not avocado. I remember to say she bold face. Pass and out of place. Then I remember I'm more bold than she. Everybody say, so long you're in America, you still have accent? And I say, I am the daughter of Elma and Roy. I am the daughter of Trinidad and Tobago. I name Al, I say. <laughs> Always love that. I name uh, Gyal. Yeah. Oh, yes. I name Gyal because my grandmother is like, Gyal, what are you still doing in that room? <laughs> All right, so there's another one called um, The Sea at Marabella. And again, this is um, my mother's sister lived in Marabella, which is in the south of Trinidad. So I don't know if you've heard of San Fernando, but Marabella is near there. And um, my mother, she, was, she worked a lot. And every summer she would spend a week with her friends in a place called Beque in Tobago. So she would go there and we would go to her sister's. And um, every day we would spend near the beach because my aunt was one block away from the beach. So this reminds me so much of Trinidad. I read this poem when I'm feeling melancholy and missing it. And so it's called The Sea at Marabella. 
I want the pound of ocean by the sea in Marabella. I want my woolly fat braids tied to flying ribbons flapping like birds' wings. I want my stick thin legs running after cousin Vilma's bike, begging, begging for a ride. Mouth filled with, spilled with salt air and nutty sand. I want the loose butts of old women falling out of their too small swimsuits. We laughed and laughed, their eyes halfway hidden under the rims of big Panama hats. Their French Creoles spicing up the jellyfish thick air. I want to churn the wooden ice cream freezer while the boys only pack the salt and ice. I want my Trinidad, her chest of finely sculpted bamboo bow, her shoulders the big bright jawbone of God. I want to feel the sting of hot sand, the pound of ocean from my Marabella sea, the pound of ocean from my Marabella sea. So Auntie, what is next? What do you have for us? I want to read another poem. And the one thing I notice, notice the ages that we left our homes. Uh, some two people said 11, 13. Those are the most delicate years for a young child. You know, it's like when the world is looking different, everything is turning, and there you go, you are plucked from your home that feels so, so much solace, so much safety. And um, a lot of my poems come from that feeling, that safety that, that I feel like I no longer have in the world. And so this poem is one of, one of the poems I wrote after I was in Ghana for three weeks. And this is one of the poems I wrote after I came back from Ghana. But it, it, my work always en encompasses, Trinidad is always in there somewhere. It's called Americanizing. Finally arriving in America, we grew new names, dull teeth, tough skin, tails long as Bellevue River. Our tears, sea salt, connect continents, smoke lines to find our way home quiet. Quiet now, listen, listen to rain drum. Learn to carry that blue dark heart close to your mango body. Learn to sing, learn to sing, girl. Learn to sing that bruise. And you know, one of the experiences that I had was, um, Oh, my mother gave me three names, Carol, Cheryl, Allison. And everybody called me Cheryl or Allison. So arriving here, I never really used Carol. They asked me when I was going for my citizenship to drop Carol. They say, um, you need to drop this name. You don't use it on any of your papers. And um, it's too long. Wow. Yeah, so what there was a way... They would always change people's names. Like if your name was Ram Charan, they would tell you to call it Ram, you yeah. know, because that's too long. They can't pronounce it. So this mm. poem was kind of honoring the change, the things that they expect of you and the changes they expect you to make. And one of them is accent when you're young like that. Yeah, yeah, they are. And you don't know you want to fit in. You know, you want exactly. the friends. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, yes, I'm going to read now from We Are Not Wearing Helmets. And um, I'm, I'm definitely going to read the first, the first two poems because they have significant meaning in terms of writing. And um, the first one is called Devouring the Light. 
and it was and it's written honoring Martin Luther King Jr. because I was 17 the year that I was graduating from high school and our school took us to Alabama. My, I was in a church school, Seventh-day Adventist school. So they took us to Alabama where the Seventh-day Adventist college was. And that's usually where we all went to the different Seventh-day Adventist colleges when we were in Alabama. And um, oh, we schemed and planned all the things we were gonna do without our parents for the weekend. And we got there, and um, I think the second day we were there, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And I tell you, all the foolishness that you had in your mind, what you're going to do, this and all that, for me, it went away. Because what I learned was this is a serious, serious time. This is frightening, and I'm no longer that little kid who runs outside and, you know, whatever, hang with her friends. You've got to start doing something to add to this society. And so this was, um, so this Devouring the Light, 1968, was a turning point in my life in terms of writing, in terms of being more serious. And little did I know I became a mother two years after that. So the day that, the day they killed Mark, we could not return to New York City. Our visiting senior class stuck in Huntsville. Streets blazed with suffering in that small Alabama town. In the dull shroud of mourning, the whole world went crazy, devouring whatever light came through our half-cracked windows. That is from Martin Luther King Jr. And I must say, it really set me on, on the path to becoming a writer and to having my life mean something. Hmm. The next one I'm going to read is called First Amendment Rights. And um, I was having a conversation with my Aunt V, who is, she's 103 now, one of the my mother's sisters that's still around and got a fresh mouth. <laughs> so I was having a conversation with her and she was telling me, you know, all the things that she disliked about this country, but also the things she loved, the way that women stood up and, you know, they vote, they, they make change. This is what they do, really, us, we. And so this is one experience, one of several experiences I had, one of a series Okay, First Amendment right for Aunt B on her 99th birthday. We women, and this was like during the civil rights era and, and coming ahead, you know, in the 80s, 90s, we, we were still marching and fighting. We women stood strong in our madness. In the face of wooden bats, billy clubs, horses, hoses, guns, Mad Dogs, 1955-1950, in the face of a world that was not ours, a world of dirty, twisted money and flies. Toss the worms from trees, burn curtains in windows, let the bodies spark. Throats scissored open, 1967. Late into that summer, we marched for women's rights. We marched for mothers. We were women married to our rage against the mad acrobats trying to displace us, trying to eject us. But this, this was our home, our bodies, our children. Our home, we marched long into our aging, gray hair shining. We marched, our feet covered in blood. Hangers tore us open, still we marched, 1964, 65, 68. Questions of the body, hangers tore us open, still we marched. We lit our world on fire, had our illegitimate babies, 
no father named on the birth certificate. We collected food stamps and project cheese, built cradles and tables, heads thrown back. We were defiant in our righteousness. Our bodies steamed earth. Rage became our first self. We marched arm in arm in arm. Next day, the white woman still refused to say morning at the bus stop. And that, that was such a common experience, you know. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Because you know, we'd be marching, you know, ooh, everybody. And the next day, they don't even know who you are or don't want it or pretend. Wow. You know, yeah. you've been through, you have experienced, I'm going to use this word again, some of the most pivotal times in our collective history, yes. right? I mean, even the poem before, you know, mm -hmm. Martin, yes. you know? I can't even imagine the emotions when you learned that he had been assassinated. Oh as a gosh, young. everybody, I mean, boys who were tough in our class, teasing everybody, hitting everybody. Oh boy, those boys were on the floor. And it's oh. the kind of thing you never forget. Of course. You never forget. Of course. So, you know, we didn't know what to do. We were so young and suddenly we felt so scared and just not knowing. And then away from our parents, the ones we wanted to get away. Oh, we're like, I'm going to kiss that boy this weekend, honey. <laughs> wow. Ah. And then you're you're marching, you know, during the the civil rights movement in the in the peak of that. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, you know, I wasn't so much on the, yeah. doing the civil rights one, but those that came after. You okay. Know? Yeah, okay. because I, you know, like I didn't go to the Edmund Pettus Bridge because that was a different era. Martin Luther King was young, and, you mm. know, he had all those people with him and everything. So, but, it, but you saw it, it was part of our everyday life, but somebody was getting shot. Somebody was getting, you know, just, yeah. America has a history that they're just now, I don't know if they're reckoning with it, but they have to be seeing what's happening and wondering, wait, when did we get here? And why? Well, I mean, we have a few answers, but that's a whole other. Oh call. yeah, 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 we do. We do. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. We, yeah. we have a few answers as to how you got here, yeah. American. The reason behind the the choice of the title of the collection, "We Are Not Wearing Helmets," is essentially that as a community, we are forever unprotected. You know, emotionally, mentally, physically, yeah. our physical needs yes. are unprotected. And history has shown yes. that over and over again. So it's almost as if we are not wearing helmets, which mm -hmm. is why the importance of building communities, of having communities to lean into for support, for holistic yes. support, then brings us back to wearing helmets. And so in the book, in the collection, you know, it's a focus on the women who have made Auntie Cheryl feel like she's wearing a helmet. So that yeah, was yeah. the basis for the they're, collection. They're my, safe, my safety blanket. I mean, just one thing. Right. My grandmother was an untrained midwife. But, she, you know, she didn't go to school for it or anything, but she delivered babies, mm. as many communities had midwives. And she saved a lot of children. Now... There's this epidemic where black women are dying in childbirth. Their babies are dying. It's like, wait, mm. we have no protection. Why is that in, in a country that claimed that they're so rich, their medicine is so great. But one of the things they did was they stopped the black women from being midwives. So they started adding a lot of things to it. If you have your master's, if you have this, 
listen, they get you in any way they can. And so right now, we don't have as many midwives trained or untrained as we used to. They started suing them if they found out that they were, um, yes, yes, they started suing them taking away their license. Oh yeah. So it's a constant battle and, and they fight us in every way. Yeah. It is coming at us, you know, from all angles, it, it would seem, and it feels like that sometimes. It can feel yeah. quite heavy existing, you know, in these bodies of ours, these beautiful black bodies. Um, but there is always light. Yes, and, and more important for us to support each other, our businesses, support yeah. our children. If you have a little extra money, you can put that in a in a account yeah. for a child to go to pay once one semester of school. I mean, just yeah. anything. You, you you feed some people, you know. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even for Island Girls Rock and the way that we show up in different countries. For our girls and women of Caribbean heritage, because we are intergenerational, because um, we feel that is important. But, you know, every year we have plans of different ways that we can support community. And it's come up again and again, you know, a way for us to start scholarships in certain yes. places. That yes. Maybe it's only a book scholarship, you know, but mm -hmm. we buy books. Someone, yes. as you said, yes. in semester, yes. or someone going to high school, in the Caribbean who, because books are expensive out here. They oh. were expensive when we were in high school. Yes. Now like, yeah, now more. Huh? It's, it's oh, insane gosh. to even put it together yeah. a book to allow a new high schooler who maybe whose family is struggling or not in a great place financially to be able to not have that worry, to have that concern. Yeah. And so these are things that we're constantly, you know, thinking and, Island Girls Rock is a very organic um, movement. You know, we we have a plan every year, but sometimes our community is like, no, that's not what we need. <laughs> and our <laughs> community, this okay. is what we actually need. Okay. And we're like, okay, <laughs> we'll get back to that at some point, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's always quite interesting. I went to New York and with my family, they were more concerned with, um, you know, like buying a home and getting us educated and things like that. Yeah. On our own, we had to find out about Black history to keep it in the family. And, you know, my son grew up in a home where we played Bob Marley, we played mm -hmm. Sparrow, you know, world music, because that's really what was missing and that's what we wanted him to have. Yeah. So... Yeah. I, yeah. So parents have a big job where they have big to job. add. Yeah. But that yeah. definitely is part of our job. Definitely. And this piece, as I tell you, I'm always in Trinidad. I have to say, and I sit down to write, and here she comes. Who asked you to come? Who asked you to join the conversation? It's Trinidad, but she's always all over the place. So this one is called Spell. And it's just a sweet little poem that I wrote about when I was thinking about all of the old wives tales and all the things we do. Like I remember hearing my aunts talk about, yeah, you know, she husband leaving, she boiled something and throw it by the door, put that under the bed. And I, you know, I have kept that with me and made up some of my own too. So this is kind of like that poem, Bell. I carry my big up self to Trinidad, hoping the seawater could wash away the bitter taste of this maljo blight that not so good man leave in my house. A nasty wind blow in my face when I reach Tuna Puna. The fish market, it nearly make me faint. I rush off the damn put put taxi and ask the woman in the pretty guava sari and the blue henna painted hands, how much it does cost to light a white candle here for broken hearts? She look at me good and with a serious face, she said, candle, I will help you now, Missy. But hear what and follow me good. Get a brasso tin 
and put your business in it. Buried on the first river bank you see, take two rum and wind your waist like it has spring. For three days, drink tea bag black, no coffee. Take two sea bath, it go cut that maljo light. I'm giving you two cigar, light one for every sea bath. I go give you a small bag of vetiver grass, hang it round your neck. Then go over say, six hundred dollars, Miss Lady. Six hundred for what? I is the cheapest rum here, ask anybody. I don't want to fight this early morning, Miss Lady. Just pay me my money. Cash only. No credit card, American Express, nothing like that. Just cash. Four weeks pass and nothing working. Is Vetting making me sneeze? The spring in my way is so rusty it break and the rum giving me bad feelings. To tell the truth, I frayed seawater and I was hoping to work half the spell because half the heart ready and the other half still pending. <laughs> wow. So, Love that it. is my old wife's tale. <laughs> Love it. I love that you, you know what? I love that you speak about us in all of our glories, you know, in all of our multifaceted selves. Yes, yes. It's not just <laughs> one layer. It's not this myopic view of who we are as Caribbean people and more specifically Caribbean women, island girls. You know, the way that casting spells and voodoo and yes, yes. <laughs> You know, our people being enslaved when really these are like plant medicine. It's, you know, the, it's plant and it's, you know, it's, it's tradition, part of our heritage, but it's, it's been vilified and denied. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. And misunderstood. Very much misunderstood. Yes. It's been a wonderful conversation. It and has. I'm so glad you asked me. This was a treat for me. I am happy yeah. that you said yes, we are happy. It took a while for us to get here. It took a while here. for us to get together. My life yes. got busy, busy, and crazy. But <laughs> Understandable. Life yeah. is life, as they say. It life is. is life, everyone. <laughs> and you know, this, this the book that's coming up is my um, yes. Tell us about third that. book in three years. Wow. So wow. it's been... <laughs> wow. I'm crazy. Yeah. What is the name of the one that's coming out soon? The Limitless Heart, new and selected poems. The Limitless Heart. And when what's the publishing date for that one? Um October 17th, and it's by Haymarket Books. They oh. put out the Mama Fight Represents. Wow. But I can't get off before I show your girl, her friend. Um, I know you saw this already, but yeah. I just had to show it. <laughs> no. I'm glad that, that we did this. Thank you so much. Sure, yeah. it. Thank you very much. Yeah, you have fortified my Sunday, that's for sure. Oh. I'm, feeling, yeah, I'm feeling a bit more grounded, for sure. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you so All much. Right. Enjoy the rest of your Sundays. Okay, you. do the same. Bye. Bye bye. Nevis next year. <laughs> yes, a literary festival in Nevis. Let's do it. Yes, let's, let's do, do it. it. I love okay. Girls Rock. Let's get lit festival. We doing okay. it. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> bye everyone. Bye. bye. bye.